والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته That's definitely uh, post eight rakahs on a Friday night. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I promise I'm going to extract the energy out of you. Okay, so by the time we're done, you're going to be feeling very different, inshallah. It's okay, it's normal. We're, we're tired, <laughs> it's late, it's Friday, but you're here. And I think that says something about you. It says something about what you want to accomplish this Ramadan and this Laylat al-Qadr. Just curious, show of hands, how many people have been with us before, attended one of the previous workshops? You can just put your hands up. I can see a lot of new, new people, okay? Very good. So not making a lot of references to old material. Fantastic. Let's set the stage. And the time is limited, but the opportunity is incredible. So what's happening in the next 10 days? By the way, this is an interactive workshop, so you're going to have to, you know, participate. So what's happening in the next 10 days? Laylat al-Qadr, yes. Oh man, it's going to be like extracting teeth out of you guys. <laughs> okay, Laylat al-Qadr is coming, right? And of course, uh, as uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, let me just bring this over here. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the part to focus on Indeed we send it down on a blessed night For we always warn against evil On that night On that night is when every matter of wisdom Is ordained and commanded by us For we have always sent messengers What happens in Laylatul Qadr? Of course we know Laylatul Qadr is special Why? Because what was sent down in Laylatul Qadr? The Quran. Yes, very good. Thank you. Quran was sent down. Iqra. That was the first night that the Quran was revealed in this world. It was Laylatul Qadr. But something else happens every year during Laylatul Qadr. What is this mysterious thing that comes down every year during Laylatul Qadr? Does anyone know? Something very special. What is this ordained matter that comes every year? I told you this is a workshop. Huh? We're going to work. <laughs> Anyone? Raise a hand or shout it out. Yes. Yes, the destiny. The destiny is sent. So, like, let's just imagine this, okay? And, and I've been told to stay seated so that I you know, don't upset the camera, but I can't help it sometimes. Uh, let's just imagine your destiny for the next year is going to be sent down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one of the next 10 nights, starting tomorrow night. One of the next 10 nights, your destiny. Think about it. What is your destiny for the next year? Do you want to know? It's coming in the next 10 nights. One of them could be tomorrow, could be any of them before I eat. It's coming. Okay? So what are this, what's at stake here is basically your whole life. <laughs> Every ease, every difficulty, every risk, every sustenance, every job, every wealth, every marriage, every children, everything is coming in the next 10 nights. I mean, I'm shocked that this room is not full, <laughs> right? Because this is it. This is your life that we're talking about here. So the Qadr is descending. Now we have something else at our disposal that can affect this. As the Prophet ﷺ says, that nothing extends one's lifespan except al-birr, righteousness, and nothing averts this divine decree. So the divine decree is coming, but nothing can avert it except a duha supplication. So not only is it coming down, but Allah has given you and has given me a tool that can transform, that can change, that can shape your destiny. Allah has given it to you. A gift called dua. Any Muslim has that tool at their disposal. This is incredible. Do you see what's happening here? In fact, the dua is so powerful that it can actually neutralize a calamity. Listen to the hadith where the Prophet says that caution is of no avail against the decree. So, you know, uh, being careful 
oh, I'm going to be careful. That actually doesn't stop the qadr. If you're careful, then the qadr was going to come to you. If you're not careful, then that qadr was going to come to you. So there's nothing you can do to stop it. But supplication benefits those things that have occurred and have not yet occurred. For indeed, while the tribulation is descending, to the, the supplicant meets it and they remain struggling with one another until the day of judgment. So the, the, the calamity is coming. The tribulation is coming down. Imagine, the angels are coming and they're bringing it. And then, here you are making dua. And your dua shoots up, fires up like a, like a rocket. And it nullifies. And it cancels it out. And it neutralizes that, that, that accident that you were going to get into. That illness that was going to come to you. Whatever difficulty that was going to come your way. You have the power to change that. You have the power to change that just by asking Allah, by raising your two hands. Is anyone excited about this? We see some hands or some head nods. Okay, all right, we're, we're getting there. We're getting warmed up. Very good. It gets even crazier because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you and has promised me that He will answer every dua. Look at this. There is no Muslim who calls upon Allah with words in which there is no sin or severing of family ties. We're going to get into that a little bit later. But Allah will give him one of three things. So Allah is basically guaranteeing, look, I'm going to answer it one way or another. You're going to get something. Either you're going to get that thing very soon, or Allah will store it for you and save it for you on the day of judgment in the hereafter, or he will remove something bad from him that is equivalent to what he is asking for. And so the Sahaba, they, they understood. They said, well, then we should make a lot of du'a. And he said, Allah is greater. Whatever you want to ask for, Allah is greater. Allah is greater. So no matter what you ask for, Allah will answer some way. Maybe not the way you like, maybe not the way you want, maybe not on your schedule, but Allah will answer. Do you feel that in your heart? Do you feel the confidence, the certainty, without a doubt, that Allah, Rabbul Alameen, will answer you, and He will answer me, and He will answer everyone in this room, and everyone who's praying in the other room, and He will answer every single Muslim's dua around the world when we ask Him. Because Allah is greater. Some people say, oh, by the way, uh, Allah, sometimes He doesn't answer, but He likes to delay it. This, and they cite this hadith for, that uh, delay it because I love to hear their voice. This is actually a weak hadith. I was looking into this. This is a weak hadith. It does not mean that we can take its meaning at face value. So be careful when people say, oh, uh, Allah is just delaying the dua because you know, he wants you to continue making dua. Not necessarily. Maybe he wants to uh, get you to be consistent. And we're going to talk about that to show the level of iman in your heart. We're going to talk about that. But it's not because, oh, he, he likes to hear your voice, doesn't like to hear your voice. No, Allah wants everyone to be making dua. So put that aside. Okay, last thing. I have to stand up for this. I can't. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I have to. Check this out. Results. Everyone wants results. We want to harness the power of Laylatul Qadr. Why? Because we want to change our lives. We want to change the reality of our lives, of our situation. But we have a misunderstanding about what the results are. Look at these ayat from Surah Al-Fajr, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when human being is being tested by their Lord, فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعَمَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَكْرَمًا You get good stuff in your life. Family, wealth, car, house, all these great things are happening. You're getting married. Kids, life is great, you got promoted. So you say, Rabbi Akraman, Allah is being good to me. He's, in, in, he's honoring me. But implicit in there is because I deserve it. And then the opposite. And then when he is tested by them, by limiting the provision. Then he says, no, Allah has humiliated me. Allah has undeservedly humiliated me. I don't deserve that. But we're looking at the wrong thing. We're looking at the outcome. We're looking at the, the so-called result, the thing that we want. And so our hearts are attached to the outcome. But that's the whole, that's the whole point. 
is that Allah is testing us. He wants to test us with ease and He wants to test us with difficulty. He wants to see what we're going to do. He wants to see where your heart is at. What is your relationship with Him? And we're going to talk about that more. So don't get it twisted. Don't get confused when it comes to the results that we're after. Of course we want the result. We want the outcome. But what's more important is the state of our hearts. Okay, so I drew a diagram. To just like understand this entire workshop, we're going to break it down. Okay, I see some people chuckling already. <laughs> it gets better. Okay, so there's you on one side and there's Allah on the other. Okay, you're smiling. Alhamdulillah, you're here in this workshop. You're a very happy person. I can tell. But there, there are some factors at play. And I want to just kind of illustrate that with this picture. We're going to keep coming back to this diagram. Okay, so there's Allah, there's you. What does Allah do? What is Allah's nature? Allah's nature is to provide. He sends down the destiny. He sends down the decree. He sends down the provision. Money, wealth, whatever. All this is coming down, we know, in the next 10 days. Good? Allah is al Karim. Allah is al Manan. Allah is al Wahab. Allah is al Raza, al Nafi, al Rauf. He is giving. He is kind. He is merciful. He, 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 he's the one who benefits. He gives gifts. He is the one who provides and sustains the entire universe. It's in his nature to give. That's just what Allah does. So he does it. But what happens? Between you and Allah, something can come up. And they, those are the blockers. There are some blockers, some, some things, we're going to talk about what they are, that actually can prevent the sustenance or the dua from going through. Right? So for you, what matters actually isn't just those blockers, but also the state of your heart. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. And we're going to do some activities and we're going to work on your heart here tonight. And then that heart, and you think about a relationship. You know, if you're married or you have a relationship with a parent or a child, a sibling, whatever, you have a relationship. It's two people. They have a relationship, right? There's two sides, two parties in a relationship. Guess what? In this relationship you have with Allah, Allah's side is perfect. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. Allah's got it. He's giving, He's loving, He's merciful, He wants to take care of you, wants to provide for you. That's what Allah does. Okay, so <laughs> what about the other side of the, that relationship? That's what matters. That's what we have to influence. Right? We don't have to worry about Allah's side, we have to worry about our side. So then, from that heart emanates what? The du'a. We ask Allah, we beseech Allah. And the manner and the, and the way that we make those du'a, it, it, it affects the effectiveness of the du'a. Does it reach its target or not? And then there are some things, I call them acceptance amplifiers. Okay? They, they magnify your, uh, your outcomes, your results, and we're going to talk about those. And don't worry, if you, if you want to take pictures, there's one slide at the very end that summarizes everything. So just stay for that. Just stay with us, all right? So this is the diagram. We're going to walk through this. We're going to go through the evidences and the proofs and all this stuff, and we're going to do, do some activities. Does that sound good to everyone? Is everyone excited to get into this? Does this make sense? Yeah, like there are some things that you need to do in order to meet Allah. Allah's always ready to meet you. So we've got to eliminate the obstacles, you know, take your foot off the brake, you know, if you want the car to move, get the obstacles out of the way and then put your foot on the gas. Then you can go. Then you can connect. Then you can meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very good. All right. And Imam ibn al-Qayyim, alayhi rahmatullah, he says that dua is like a weapon. And a weapon is only as good as the person who is wielding it. Isn't that true? He says that it's not the matter of how sharp it is. If the weapon is perfect and free of faults and the arm of the person is using it is strong, there's nothing stopping him, and then he can lay waste to the enemy. But if any of these three features are lacking, then the effect will be lacking accordingly. So it's all about you. You have this perfect weapon in your hand, this dua that Allah has gift gifted us. Let's make use of it, shall we? All right, let's start with the blockers. Like I said, take our foot off of the brake first. Right? You don't press the gas when you have your foot on the brake. So let's talk about the blockers. The first and most important blocker, is forbidden sustenance. Al-mal al-haram, al-rizq al-haram. 
Okay, and we're going into the last 10, and I know you can't exactly change this if you're, <laughs> if we're starting right now. Like, let's say you have a job or something, or you have wealth that's coming in from Haram Source. You can't exactly change it. Nonetheless, I wanted this to be like a complete study of how to maximize our relationship with Allah and through these du'a, right? So, in this hadith, it's in the Nawawi 40 as well, the Prophet ﷺ says, O people, in Allah tayyib, wa la yaqbalu illa tayyib, that Allah is indeed, He is good, and He is uh, wholesome, and He does not accept that which is good. And then he recited some of these ayat uh, when he said, O oh, you messengers, eat the good things and do righteous deeds, and verily I am acquainted with what you do. And he said, O oh, you who believe, eat from the good things we have provided you. So he's telling you, it matters. Like, isn't this weird? Like, we don't really focus a lot on this. I don't, I don't know. I don't hear a lot of people talking about this. But where you get your sustenance from affects what Allah can, what, what level of acceptance you have. And the Prophet ﷺ gave an example. He like, really wants to send this message home. And he says, imagine a person who's a traveler. He's undertaking a journey. His hair is disheveled. He's covered in dust. He raises his hands to the heavens. He says, oh Lord, oh Lord, ya Rabbi, ya Rabbi. Like, wow, this, this guy, his heart is in the right place. He's a traveler. His du'a is accepted. He's saying, oh, ya Rabbi, ya Rabbi. Wow, so sincere. Yet, his food is from haram. His drink is from haram. His clothing is from haram. And he was nourished from haram. How can this person's du'a be answered? How is it possible? Because you're taking sustenance from the haram. Instead of taking sustenance from the halal, what Allah has given and ordained. So wherever you're getting your sustenance from, and like, let's make this very practical. Like, if you work in the defense industry, if you work in semiconductor industry, like where are those semiconductors being used? Like there, there's real questions that we need to ask ourselves, brothers and sisters. Your investment portfolio, your 401k, do you have bonds in your portfolio? How much interest is, you know, did you have a, in, in institutional funds, whatever? Look at the, the funds that you're investing in and those companies. Like, we can really break it down. Like, where is the haram? How much of that is haram? Of course, we pay zakah to purify our wealth. We give extra sadaqah to purify our wealth. But we need to be very careful about this. This could be a whole workshop, by the way. It's not my expertise, but this is, it could be a whole workshop in and of itself. Rizq uh, al-haram. Next, asking for haram. Okay, obviously, you can't make dua and expect Allah to answer you if you're making dua for something haram. Like, what, why would Allah, Allah would never accept that dua, right? So that's a blocker. That's like a non-starter. You can't go, right? There's no Muslim who calls upon Allah with words in which there's no sin or severing family ties. So, so that phrase, like, he, he put that qualification. If you're asking for some, something sinful or breaking family ties, Allah's not going to answer you, Okay. And there are many types or aspects of haram, things that you could be asking for, like sins, like dua that includes shirk, uh, wishing for death. That, that's another one. I don't, I don't want to go through all the evidence for all these, but just want to like real quick bullet these out. Asking for punishment, like hastening of the punishment, uh, because that's like limiting Allah's mercy in a way. Uh, making dua against your family, for example, severing family ties, limiting mercy, like, oh, Allah, have mercy on this land, but not that land, or these people, not these people. Uh, despair also in dua. Like, there's one thing to be, like, desperate and, and putting your trust in Allah and reaching out, but if you reach a state of despair where you, you think that, oh, Allah can't even help you, then definitely also a uh, non-starter. And only asking for patience. Like, one of the things about dua is you actually are asking to change the qadr. You have to go out of your way to ask to change the qadr. Like if you have a sickness or an illness and you say, oh Allah, change this, oh Allah, heal me. It's not, oh Allah, give me patience to deal with the sickness. Because then what? That's sort of implying Allah is not powerful enough to change this, right? It's this situation. So we actually want to ask Allah for very big things. Because we know how big and incredible and powerful and amazing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Does that make sense? You guys with me? Losing you? No? Okay. One person. Okay. Alhamdulillah. I <laughs> appreciate that. Okay. Also, non-starter. Asking the wrong way. Like asking conditionally. Like people think they, that they're being polite. 
the Prophet ﷺ says, let not any one of you say, oh Allah, forgive me, in shit, if you will. You know, or Allah, have mercy on me, in shit, if you will. Like, like pretty please, oh Allah. There's actually a, 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 an etiquette, a, a way to asking. You don't say like, please Allah, it, you know, it would be so nice if you could do that. No, you, you, you use in grammar, it's called the imperative tense. It's a command. But obviously we're not commanding Allah. Allah is all powerful. We're not going to tell him what to do. But you say it in the grammatical form of a command. It's very important uh, because he says, let him be resolute in the matter while knowing that no one can compel Allah to do anything. Obviously we can't tell. We can't force Allah to do anything. But it's the manner in which it's said matters. Another one is raising the voice. And obviously we're not going to go through all this, but uh, I just want to highlight this part where the Prophet ﷺ said that, O people, show mercy to yourselves, for you are not calling on one who is deaf and absent or absent. Verily you are calling on one who is all hearing and near to you and is with you. So Allah is here. And sometimes, you know, maybe... I'm not here, obviously, but some masajid, or you may have experienced this before, where the imam gets like really into the dua and starts like really calling on Allah and starts like raising the voice. That's not that's not appropriate, right? That's not the proper way. And the scholars also they say this may be a form of riyat, showing off or shirk, you know, some of the minor shirk, because why are you really doing that? Like saying like these complicated duas and trying to get people to cry and you know. So there's, there's a lot of like inner heart work there. Uh, obviously, if you're by yourself, you don't need to raise your voice either. <laughs> as, you'll, as we'll also see when we talk about the manners. So we talked about conditionally raising the voice. Also, the wrong kind, form of ta, what's called tawassul, like using something to get closer to Allah. Uh, and that can be like a form of shirk. And then only asking others to pray for you. Like, oh, I'm such a sinner. I'm such a terrible person. Allah will never answer my dua. I need someone who is a righteous person like you to answer my dua. Like, really? Really? That, then you're shutting the door to Allah's mercy. You're basically saying, I'm so bad that Allah will not forgive, for, will not forgive me. I'm so terrible that Allah's incredible and all-encompassing mercy is smaller than my sins. Are you kidding me? That is a huge, that is a sin. That is a huge problem. You can never think that. You can never say that. Allah's mercy is overwhelming and infinite. Nothing you ever could do in your entire lifetime could overwhelm it. Even the shirk. Allah can forgive it when you repent and become a, you know, become a Muslim. So the only asking others, that's like a very, it's like a subtle form of you know, this, this kind of a sin. So that's asking the wrong way. Another one is hastiness. Okay, so Prophet says, uh, every one of you will have his supplication answered, again, reaffirming what we said in the beginning, as long as he's not impatient, and he says, I have supplicated, but it was not answered. So again, like we were talking about earlier, being consistent, and that's going to come up again later, you need to, you need to stick with it. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, Amazon Prime here, you know, it's not... Uh, one hour delivery, now, you know, we're trying to upgrade to one hour delivery or same day delivery. That's not how dua works. <laughs> Although uh, we're conditioned to expecting, you know, instant gratification in all, in all forms and fashion, that's not how Allah works. So we should not, you know, be very imp impatient, very hasty. Give it some time. Allah will deliver when the time is right. Okay, so these are the blockers. Right? We talked about this. forbidden sustenance, asking for the harm, asking the wrong way, and hastiness. Those are the blockers. And I know, mashallah, everyone wants to capture the, <laughs> the slides, uh, get the photo. Don't worry, it's all going to be on one slide at the end. You just, you just need one slide. Okay, this is the most important part. Okay, so the blockers, we just get them out of the way. That's like a logistical thing. But when it comes to the state of the heart, let's talk about that. Because that's where it all originates. And that's what we can control. And I want to start with Allah's beautiful names. Asma'illah al-Husna. Because Allah commands us to use them. Walillahi al-Asma'il al-Husna. Fad'uhu biya. This is a command. Call upon Him using these names. And when you know the names and attributes of Allah, then you're more likely to call upon Him. Because you know He is Al-Wahhab. 
He is al Karim. He will give and he is generous when he gives. So you know who you're dealing with. You know how to interact and engage with Allah. So it's very important to actually know and study the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to know his names and attributes. And not just, you know, like memorize the song. No. Like, know them, like, like in your heart, know them. Like in your heart. Really feel it. Like when you say Allah is al Karim, do you really know like how generous that is? Can you comprehend and try to wrap your head around it? That's what I mean by really understanding and using those names. And when you call him on him, Ya Akram al Akramin, do you feel it? So that's the beginning, again, and it originating with Allah. But then also is sincerity, like the, where your heart is at is sincerity. So, so Allah subhanahu wa says, فَدَوَاللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ And call upon him with sincere devotion. Like where your heart is at, that level of sincerity really matters. And we just heard, you know, Sheikh Said was reciting from Surah Al-Ahzab. لِيَسْأَلَ الصَّادِقِينَ عَنْ صِدْقِهِمْ Like Allah is putting the believers through all those trials in Al-Ahzab. Why? To, to check, to test, to verify the, the truthfulness of these believers, the, 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 the level of sincerity and truth that they have in their heart. That there are these believers that have been true to what they promised. They have that level of sincerity, like it's real. That's what we're looking for here. And we're going to dive much deeper into this, sincerity. And again, for just in the interest of time, we're going to kind of skip some of these parts. Uh, but Allah talks about an example here about the people when they go on the ship. Okay, they're going on the ship and it's sailing and the wind is great and everybody's happy. But then suddenly there's a huge wind and the people are overwhelmed by these waves from every side and they assume that they are doomed. Halas, the, the wind has come, the ship is going to capsize, we're in the middle of the ocean, this is it, this is the end. So then what, what happens? Imagine putting yourself in that position where you think like, all right, this is it. I see the wind, I see the rocks, we're gonna, hit, we're gonna capsize, this is the end of my life. And you have like a moment of clarity and at that moment, at that moment, that's when they called out to Allah in sincerity. Like, if you, if you save us from this, that if you save us, Allah. Like, you ever, like, make a deal with Allah? <laughs> Where you say, oh, Allah, if you just, like, heal my mother. Or if you just, oh, Allah, if you just, like, get me this job. Or, oh, Allah, if you, you know, we get, I get this girl or I get this guy. Then that's it. I'm going to be the perfect Muslim. And I'm going to you know, pray five times a day and pray sunnah and do all these things. Like that's, what, that's where their head was at. Like, I will put it all on the table for you, Allah. And they prayed. And then as soon as he rescues these people, because that's what happened, he rescues them. And then they turn, they turn back and turn away. So were they sincere or were they not sincere? They, they, they were sincere in the beginning, but then they flipped and they were not. Because when they got back to land, they didn't keep their promise. So where your heart is at matters, right? And that's the beautiful thing about Islam. That's the beautiful thing about this way of life is that it's actually super easy for you to purify your heart. There's this time when Umar ibn Khattab, we love Umar, he comes to the Prophet and he just goes up to him. Imagine the Prophet is like sitting. He goes up to him and he says, Oh, Messenger of Allah, you are more beloved to me than everything except myself. Like, look at, look at that clarity that he has. Like, he knew. <laughs> everything except me. Like, I love myself more than I love you. And so the Prophet said, No. And by the one whose hands is my soul, not until I am more beloved to you than yourself. So then what happened? Omar, he said, then indeed I swear by Allah that you are more beloved to me now than myself. And the Prophet said, Al-Ana ya Omar, now, now you're right. Now you got it. Omar, now you figured it out. 
So what happened in that like short period? There's another version of this hadith where Omar explains what happened. And he says, I thought to myself, who do I need more? Myself or the Messenger of Allah He gave me Islam. He's the one who's going to do the shafa ah on the Day of Judgment. He will start the Day of Judgment itself. He will be the one who intercedes on behalf of all the believers. Actually, he's a lot more useful than me and my deeds. Actually, I love him more than I love myself. So he took a moment and he kind of did some internal processing and he changed where he was at and then he proclaimed his love and the, the, the rectification of that status to the Prophet And we're going to do that right now. Uh, well, not right now, but like in five minutes. Okay, we're going to practice that. But first, I have just a couple more slides just to get you, you know, warmed up here. The next part of, of the state of the heart is having a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because uh, as the Prophet says in the hadith Qudsi, he says that Allah says, I am just as my slave thinks of me. And the translation even has a little you know, explanation. I'm able to do for him what he thinks I can do for him. So if you think that Allah is not powerful enough to help you in your situation, well, guess what? I have bad news for you. Allah is not going to answer your dua. Because whatever you think, wait, so my level of certainty, certainty actually can affect the outcome of the dua, if it's answered or not. So if I believe and I am convicted, I have conv conviction that Allah will indeed answer my prayer, then that's exactly what he's going to do. Having a good opinion of Allah. And knowing that Allah will answer. So there's almost like a cognitive part of this, as Allah subhanahu wa says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Like it's so clear cut. Allah has proclaimed, call on me, I will answer you. Like, it doesn't get more <laughs> simple and clear than that. If you call, I will answer. And we've already explored this. So you have to know it in your, in your head and know it in your heart. Okay, story time. I knew that you were going to be tired at this point, so now we have a bit, a bit of a story. Okay, so there's... This is a story about uh, a brother, probably some of you know, know this person, um, in the community. And this is many years ago. And he said, I want to put that to the test. Okay, so he was aware of these verses and things. He said, I want to put that to the test. So he said, okay, Laylatul Qadr, I'm going to try it. I'm going to make a dua that's so big and crazy, but I believe that Allah will do it. He said, I want to double my income in this year. I want to double my income. Okay, that's pretty crazy. Like, double? How do you double your income in one year? Usually we get a raise, it's like 2%, 3%, 5%. You get a new job, it's like, you know, 10%. But double? 100% increase? So he said, I believe. I believe in Allah, I believe in His power, I believe that this will happen. This is a true story, by the way. Um, so the brother is making, you know, young guy, so not like a ton of money, but decent money. And, you know, he goes through the year, and he's kind of wondering, and he gets a bit of a raise, and, you know, and then he kind of forgets about the du'a. Until he's, you know, going through, and then actually tax season comes. And he starts filing his taxes, and he's looking at the number, and he sees something strange. He says, he sees the number, let's just say for easy, easy numbers sake, let's just say he was making 50,000. Uh, obviously he wasn't living in the Bay Area. <laughs> let's say he was making 50,000, and, uh, and so now he saw the number on his taxes. You know when you file your taxes and you see all, like you see your income before taxes, all that? The, guess what the number was? I want to just hear some guesses. Obviously, you know where the story is going. So get, get, I want to hear some guesses. A hundred. Anyone else? More than a hundred? Did I hear more? No? Everybody thinks about a hundred? 130? Okay, we got a little bit more than a hundred. The number was 101. Almost as if Allah is saying to this brother, 
Like, you want to limit me? You want to limit my generosity to you? Here, I'm going to show you that not only am I going to double your income, but I'm going to increase it just a little bit more, just so you know next time that you were stingy and not me. Allah. Allahu Akbar. And he didn't remember it. He forgot. He totally forgot about this dot. He made it with sincerity. But look how Allah delayed it. Now I'll tell you what happened in, in, behind the scenes. So actually what wound up happening is he got a bonus. And it was a very strange bonus because he was part of some program where in his company, like loyalty, if you stay around and you're a leader and, you know, so they gave him some credits that were eventually translated into some financial value. So they set a pool of money aside for like top performers and da da da. And it just so happened that the right number of people left the company who were eligible for those points. Uh, and also like the currency conversions that the company is going through uh, because they did a lot more business in Europe and outside of the US. And it just so happened that when you put all those factors together, that Allah gave, that got this huge bonus, but of course, because it was a bonus, it was taxed very heavily. So next time, be more specific in your du'a and don't <laughs> say after tax, you know? <laughs> so because Allah, is, Allah, He gave, hey, I gave you what you asked for, right? Double your income, right? Uh, so, so this is a true story that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did for this brother. It's incredible, incredible. That Allah's mercy, Allah's generosity, it knows no bounds. Our conceptions of reality, that's what's limited, right? Also, having humility is a very important aspect of this. Uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ud'u rabbakum tadarwan wa khufiya, that call on your Lord humbly and secretly. Surely he does not like the transgressors. And this also relates to not raising the voice, right? Because if we're being humble, if we're being, doing it in secret, we're not like yelling and shouting and making it a big thing. It's an intimate thing. You know, like if you have like a close friend or, you know, like if I have young kids and so they come and they whisper, you know, like they, you know, it's like an intimate, it's a close thing. And that's, that's the energy that we're coming with to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also consistency. Uh, we know the famous hadith of the Prophet sallallahu be mindful of Allah and you will find him in front of you and recognize, acknowledge Allah in times of ease and prosperity and he will remember you in times of adversity. And again, it's like, okay, Brother Kareem, you're kind of late here. We're starting the last 10 nights tomorrow. But, you know, this is for completeness sake. Know Allah in adversity. When things are hard, reach out to him. But also, when things are good. Because it's a relationship. Like, imagine you have a friend who is only there for you when things are good. Hey, life is good. You're fun. You're happy. We're going to hang out. Great. And then as soon as things go bad, oh, actually, I'm busy. Oh, actually, like, I can't speak with you. Uh, oh, actually, I can't support you. Right? So being consistent. And also repetition in the du'a. Ibn Mas'ud reports this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that when he would make du'a, that he would, he would supplicate three times. And when he would ask Allah, he would ask three times. So actually, the repetition in the du'a, it's, that's a form of humility. Like you're begging Allah, begging Allah, begging Allah. Three times, repeating, repeating, repeating. And that is a form of humility. On that note, here's another story. And this one is, uh, is from a brother I knew. Uh, I'm originally from Southern California. So a brother I knew in, in Southern California. There's this area, a city called Mission Viejo. They have a lake. It's a moderately sized lake. So this brother, we used to work together. After work, Indonesian brother. I love this guy. He's such a sincere, just amazing, you know, just beautiful heart. And so he told me this story. Uh, we used to carpool to Juma and stuff, and you know, he told me this story. So he says, after work, I would go for a walk around the lake. You know, just kind of go for a walk. And he, he says, I would do my adhkar. You know, I would say like, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, you know, Astaghfirullah, and just, you know, like make dua for stuff. And, and every day I would just keep doing that. Like every day after work, like, that was just his thing get some stress out, go for a walk, nice beautiful lake, SoCal weather, it's amazing. And he said, I used to be in a halakha with these guys. And by the way, uh, one of the things he used to make dua for is going to hajj. 
Now, the brother was not making a lot of money, and obviously he was an immigrant from uh, Indonesia. He, you know, was having like, you know, pretty junior position at the company, and he wanted to go to Hajj. And of course, as we know, Hajj can be pretty expensive. And, you know, he's making du'a, making du'a, saying istighfar, and doing all this stuff. And then he's in this halaqa, and in his halaqa, there's like a bunch of guys, some religious, some not religious. It's like more, more religious than some of them. And there was this one guy who's like not that religious, but pretty rich, okay? So this guy has a heart attack. And he survives, alhamdulillah. And then he realizes like, okay, I'm getting old, just had this heart attack. Maybe I'm going to die before I perform hajj. Let's go perform hajj. So he announces to the group, hey guys, I'm going to miss the next couple halaqas because I'm going to be gone for hajj. And this brother, heartbroken. Like, oh my gosh, that's not fair. Like, I really want to go to hajj. Really want to go. And I, I just, I can't. But I've been, I've been asking Allah and asking Allah. And if the story ended there, like that would be like where what we do. Like we always, we, we think like today is the end of the story. No, no, my brothers and sisters. Let the story complete. Let the story finish. Have some patience. So what happened? He announces and he says, Khalas, I'm not going to be here. So then what he continues, uh, the halaqa, whatever they finish. And then later that week, he gets a call from the brother. Hey, assalamu alaikum. Listen, um, you know I'm going to hajj. He said, yeah, yeah, I, I know. Like, way to rub it in. He said, I, I'm not that religious and I don't know that much stuff. And I want someone to come with me who is religious, who does know like all the du'as and things to say. And I want that person to be you. I want you to come with me. I'm going to pay for everything. But I just need somebody that I know and trust with me when I go on this journey. Are you open to doing that? <laughs> He's like, of course, <laughs> absolutely, I would love to. And alhamdulillah, mashallah, he went and, you know, may Allah accept his hajj. That's the power of consistency. Like, look what he did. He just had this habit, small habit. Like, you don't even, even you like the other brother. Like, you don't even think about these du'a. Like, you make the du'a, you kind of forget about it. It's not even a thing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivers. Allah delivers. Why? Because of the consistency, because of the repetition. So state of the heart. Use his beautiful names, having sincerity, having conviction, having a good opinion of Allah, humility, consistency, and repetition. Now, we're going to do something kind of weird, okay? Uh, and I don't know how much time we have. Do, do we have until 11? Where's, we have until 11? Okay. Oh, man. We have, did I hear 11.30? <laughs> Some people are trying to get a little extra time. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. All right. So I want, we want to do something here, Okay. What I want you to do is to imagine. I want you to close your eyes and imagine. I want you to think about that thing that you kind of gave up on. Whatever that hope, that dream, that desire, that wish, I want you to bring it to mind. And I want you to think about how incredible Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, how powerful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, how generous Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And I want you to put those two things next to each other and imagine that Allah opened all the doors, that Allah facilitated every possibility and that he made this thing, whatever it is, a reality. Okay? Now you can open your eyes. We're going to do a journaling activity. So you can get out your phone and you can look at the QR code. I'll give you a second to, to do that. If you want to do it on your phone, if you have a pen and paper, even better. But for those, I know last time we had a snafu with all the, like, uh, the worksheets and whatnot. So you can just get the QR code. We're going to do a little journaling activity. And I'm definitely going to run out of time. <laughs> So, you may want to take the QR code because it has all the questions. So, the journaling activity. 
actually, I'm going to make a judgment call. Can I trust you to do that activity on your own? Only two yeses. OK, definitely not going to trust you to do that. <laughs> OK, so the journaling activity. This is, this is what we're going to do, OK? So we have some questions. So this is a Google form, uh, is, is the QR code. It has the questions there. You put your email so that you can get it sent back to you. I'm not collecting the emails and all that stuff. I'm not collecting the information. Um, but do that, and it will get sent back to you. We have a few questions. So think about that thing, that dream, that goal that you've had for a long time. I want you to think about how long you've had that dream, how long you've had that goal. Then how has life been like since you've been in that state of lack or desire? Why? Because when we have this like neediness, that means that we're not in acceptance to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not in at, at peace. We're not in a state of Islam when it comes to Allah, tawakkul, trusting Allah. We're in a state of desire, right? So how has life been? And really try to find any themes or trends or things like that. And then how do you feel about it? Like, are you frustrated? Are you angry? Are you sad? Are you... And then how do you act as a result of the goal and your feelings about it? In other words, well, I'm so frustrated that I stopped doing this. I'm so frustrated that I no longer, you know, do that. And so maybe you start to give up, and that's the secondary uh, reactions that come up as a result. How do you feel? How do you act as a result of those feelings? So I've been so frustrated for so long about this thing. I've been trying to get married. I've been trying to have this job. I've been trying to whatever it is. And I've been so frustrated that I've given up. I've shut the door. Well, guess what? If you shut the door on Allah, Allah has no entry point. You've, you've rejected whatever good that Allah wants to send your way. Then we kind of flip and we look at, do you have any openness in your body for change? Like, can you feel some potential? Like, is there a sliver of hope? I want you to find that wherever that is in your body and describe it, like really feel it. And then we're going to magnify it 10 times, 100 times more powerful. How would that feel? And then we're going to turn that goal and desire over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What would happen if you gave that wish, that dream, that goal, that desire to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most powerful of those who have power? How would you behave? What would change? Right? You would be in a state of submission. You would be in a state of acceptance. And what if you went all in to try to catch Laylatul Qadr? What would that look like? And I'll say this. We know it starts tomorrow night. And if you really want to catch it, then there's one thing you have to do, which is go for all 10. Go hard all 10 nights. If this dua, in this state of your heart, and repetition of this goal, of this dream, every night for the next 10 nights. Is that something you can commit to? Because this is where you show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is where you show Him. How sincerely and how truthfully do you want it? How bad do you want it? How much do you believe that you want it? Because if you believe it, then you will do whatever it takes. And some people even say like, well, what if we start tonight? You know, just in case, like if the days were off by one, I don't want to miss one, but obviously, you know, you don't need to do that. And I, yes. Just where you feel the feeling of hope or possibility or optimism. If you feel that openness or possibility for change, where do you identify that in your body? Okay, I'm going to blaze through these last slides because I, I'm pretty sure I'm way over time. Uh, this is not the time to tie your camel. Okay, I, I know I, I did this exercise with some of my coaching clients. And, you know, they're saying, oh, but, you know, we have to tie our camel. Not in the last 10 nights. This is when miracles happen. This is when crazy stories happen, okay? You can do that the rest of the year. You should do that the rest of the year. You will do that the rest of the year. But now is the time to really believe, really open yourself up to possibility from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, real quick, I'm going to blaze through these, okay? So manners. Facing the qibla. Maintaining wudu. I told you, I'm blazing through this. Uh, praising Allah, so thanking Allah, and beginning the dua with salawat on the Prophet, alayhi salatu 
and raising your hands. These are all aspects of the manners of du'a. So they are not necessities, like your du'a is not, we could be accepted. Like if I just sit here and make du'a, I don't raise my hands, could be accepted, right? Maybe I don't have wudu, could be accepted, right? But these are some things that kind of bonus, uh, that really help and uh, the effectiveness. And using du'a from the, the Qur'an and from the sunnah as well, that is a, a, a booster. And then let's look at the amplifiers, okay? Praying for others. So these are kind of like the hacks. If you really want to make sure your du'a gets answered, start making du'a for someone else. <laughs> because there's an angel who says ameen to that du'a and says for you too. So if you want an angel making du'a for you, the way to do that is pray for someone else to get what you want. <laughs> pray for that brother to get married, you know, if you're trying to get... Pray for that brother to get a promotion, to triple his uh, post-tax income, right? Uh, <laughs> praying for others. Praying in the last third of the night. Of course, uh, this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down so we should expect, right, that's why the Qiyam programs, they start when? At the last third of the night. Uh, not to say that Laylatul Qadr doesn't start at Maghrib. Of course, that's, it's Laylatul Qadr. It's not last third of Al Qadr. Uh, but that is a special time. So you sort of, you magnify it, right? We call these the amplifiers. Uh, dua uh, between the Adhan and the Iqama is accepted. It's not rejected. So this is, again, it's amplifying your chances. So if you come here and during, during Aisha, and you come and you, you're here early and you hear the adhan and you sit and you make du'a, boom. That's another amplifier. Under the rain. By the way, it's raining. Go out in the rain. Feel the rain on your skin as the Prophet ﷺ did and make du'a in the rain. In the last third of the night. Then you start combining, right? You start mix and match. Make du'a for someone else under the rain while you're in sujood and <laughs> then you get very creative. During sujood, I mentioned that. Also, if you are oppressed, if you are a traveler, if you are a parent making a du'a for your children, these are all accepted. In another narration, it's uh, the parent, the fasting person, and the traveler. So of course we're fasting during Ramadan. So during the adhan of Maghrib and the iqama of Maghrib, okay, and you're fasting, right? So then you, again, start to mix and match. And then of course, desperation, the desperate need. Uh, when you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Someone who's distressed when he's crying out to him. When, when your back is against the wall, when you have nowhere else to turn, and you put your hands up, and you're like, I got nowhere else. Oh Allah, I got nowhere else to turn to. I'm desperate. I'm helpless and hopeless of anyone besides you. And I know that you can help me. Oh Allah. Help me. When you make du'a like that, that's when things change. Kind of like those guys on the ship. Remember the ship? They had nowhere else to turn. Why do you think they were so sincere? It's because they were in that state of desperation. They had nowhere else to turn to but Allah. So they made du'a that was super sincere, and Allah answered it. But then they messed it up. All right, we're actually going to skip this story because I know we're over time. So these are the acceptance amplifiers. Then we have some extra provision providers. I love alliteration. This is that part, the destiny and the provision. Number one, gratitude. Gratitude gives you more. So now in your du'a, you start your du'a by praising Allah. Thank you, Allah, for all of my post-tax income. Uh, you know, and you're really praising Allah for that, then Allah will definitely increase you. And repentance in Surah Nuh. He's telling Nuh, tells his people, make repentance. Why? Because Allah is forgiving. What is the consequence of this istighfar? It is. He will shower you with abundant rain, supply you with wealth and children, and he will give you gardens as well as rivers. This risk, this provision comes as a product of istighfar. So again, these are in, uh, enhancing the provision that is provided to you. And then lastly, doing good deeds. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that whoever does good, male or female, when they are a believer, will surely bless them with a good life. So if you want your life to be good, you know, this worldly life, then doing good deeds actually can enhance that. And hey, we're about to enter the last 10 and 
we're praying tarawih and we're fasting. Like, like we're doing the good deeds, right? So these are all uh, provision providers. Okay, I told you this is the slide. There was a slide to uh, get it all. I tried to squeeze it all. <laughs> tried to squeeze it all on one slide. This is everything we've talked about. Okay, I'll give you a moment. Snap, snap those photos. And you don't have to take a photo if you're not going to like reference it again. But all right, are we? Is that okay? Move on. Okay. Signs of Laylatul Qadr. Again, I'm going to blaze through this. After the fact, how do we know that we got it? The real answer to that question is you don't. You never know when it is. And if you want to say you got it, that means you want to give up and stop. Then you're in the wrong workshop, buddy. <laughs> you got to go for all 10. That's the goal, right? Like, seek it out. as the Prophet says. But, okay, fine. You want the signs? Here are the signs. It's peaceful. Salamun hiya hatta matai. But... As the Prophet says, the moon is shining typically in that night. It has a mild temperature. Uh, it is calm night, neither hot or cold. And the sun rises upon its red day and faint. As the Prophet says, uh, oh, slide is missing. Uh, and there's another one that the sun rises without rays. It's shining in the morning. It does not have rays. It's not intense. And some of the scholars say that is because there are so many angels out doing their thing, that they actually kind of interfere with the uh, electromagnetic radi radiation that comes from the sun that we call sunlight. Allah knows best on the details, okay? Uh, when is it? Again, we talked about, obviously, odd night, last 10. It's the 27th, the 29th, the 25th. And the Prophet ﷺ says that he was about to tell the people when it was, but then two people were fighting. So this is also, by the way, a sign to Reconcile with people because this can actually interfere with your job being accepted and this knowledge was taken away So he says on the seventh ninth or fifth of the last ten nights um, And in one narration, it's even the last night as well, so Don't give up basically Okay, so those are the signs. What do you say? During this night, of course make the sincere dua, but what do you say? You say, Allahumma inna ka'afoon tuhibbul afwa fa'afu anna. This is the dua that the Prophet ﷺ taught Aisha, our mother, radiallahu anha, to say during this night. Like if you don't know, you don't have dua prepared, you know, you're not those like poetic types, you just want something easy, say this. Repeat this, keep repeating it all night, in every moment. Uh, you know, don't, don't go to suhoor fest and like sit in line and like talk to people and da 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 because it's going to be during the last 10 nights, and I know you, because you were here, are going to be praying and not <laughs> doing that. You're going to be saying these dua, right? Okay, so this is the end of my presentation. Uh, I did have one story that I skipped, which I would love to share, but I, I don't know if we have time. Yeah, we're good? All right, Allah. All right. Uh, let's, let's do it. Okay, so this is, this is the last story. This is my story. Okay, this is my little father story. Uh, is it possible to do that? Oh, no. Okay. This is my Laylatul Qadr story. So also, uh, this is about how I got married. Okay? So many years ago, this is in 2009, my wife and I, or now wife, were in an off-again, on-again engagement for three years. So imagine you're a young person in your early 20s, the love of your life, and it's like Romeo and Juliet. The parents are not agreeing, and the, you know, there's all this drama, and this person comes in, and the, you know, it's like, like literally, like it could be a movie. And we're like depressed, and you know, anxiety, and I started going to therapy, and all this stuff. And I got to a point where I was like, I guess, I guess this is not working out. And we we had stopped talking for months, maybe like nine months, and I was like. Should I, should I move on from this person? I mean, I, I think this is the one, but I just, I don't know. And so I was in the masjid. This is when I lived in Southern California. And there was a brother there, dear brother, who said, man, Ramadan is coming. Why don't you make dua? And like, just give it a shot. And like, such a like casual, <laughs> such a casual thing, but literally changed my life. And that's when I was like, all right, you know what? 
I'm going for it. Like, I'm not just going for it, I'm really going for it. I made Atikaf, I stayed at the masjid, I, like, I did like extra night, like before, because I was like, I'm not going to miss Laylatul Qadr. But I also was in a state of complete acceptance of the result and the outcome. I was like, oh Allah, I'm gonna try one more time. But whatever happens, that's your decree, and I'm good with that. I really want this thing to be <laughs> the decree. I, I know you could make it the decree. You're that powerful, but even if you decide that that's not what's best for me, I will accept that. Okay, so started the last 10 nights, and I'm praying you know, in the masjid uh, you know, in Orange County, and my wife and her family are actually from like Los Angeles County, so pretty far away. That's like between like here and Oakland, let's say, uh, equivalent. And then something weird started to happen. My, my wife started to come to our masjid during the last 10 nights. Like imagine someone from Oakland coming to MCA, like that would just be like, what are you doing here? And like one night, another night, then her mom comes, what? Like, what's happening? Why, why are they here? Like, weird. Something weird started to happen. Anyway, so long story short, before you knew it, three weeks later, we were married. Why three weeks later? Because my father was out of the country for two weeks. Uh, and by the time he returned, we had a meeting with their family on Sunday, and we were married on Thursday. And Thursday was my birthday. That's, you know, how we, how we did that. And I have to tell you, brothers and sisters, that in my heart... There was no way that this was possible. I'd almost given up. Like, there was no chance that Allah, like, would have this written for me after everything we'd been through, after all the pain and the heartache and the tears and everything, that Allah would make this thing, whatever that thing, happen. There's no way. But I said, oh Allah, I believe in you. Oh Allah, you can do anything. You can make it happen. And so I, I was in that position of have my back against the wall and just be like, turn it over to Allah. And that's how we got married. And alhamdulillah, married to this day. And, and that is what I know the power of Laylatul Qadr could be for you, brothers and sisters. So I want you now, commit now, take a moment, close your eyes, and really commit to believing that Allah can change your life, that Allah can change your destiny in this coming year, this month, in these 10 days. It's possible. It is possible for you. It is possible for Allah. It is easy for Allah. And make a commitment that you will do your part in this relationship you have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will show up, you will do what you can, and Allah We'll do the rest. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.